continue our investigation of the mortgage foreclosure crisis, we have seen something incredible happen, and it is uh, through the uh, information and education from Michael Young, a futures and commodities broker and trader. Michael, uh, here we are in segment four. We're talking about how we fix all of this, and Howard Schultz from Starbucks. He's given it a shot. He says in CNN Money, again, uh, November 4th, 2011, we have a crisis of confidence in this country. Washington is not producing the leadership we need. And I think it's time that corporations and business leaders realize that we have to, with that we too have to do something. We can't wait for Washington. With all due respect, the business leaders that I've seen haven't done us well. Well, it depends on the company. I mean, there are some really hardworking, honest people in corporate America. They've done a great job. We own a, we own a lot of markets worldwide. American products are well received across the globe. And we've done a good job. The problem is, is that Washington needs to understand that we cannot continue to finance the debt that we have. And someone has to start telling people the truth about what the real liabilities that are coming and what, what it means. I think the American people, if they're shared sacrifice, and I mean by shared, that it's equal pain for everyone, not just us, and, but the New York banks get to have their own way. That's not shared sacrifice. But we're going to have to find a way to get from A to B and f with less federal money. I mean, at some point, the time will come when the federal government will hit the wall. Mm -hmm. I and mean, we're going to hit $15 trillion next week in debt. Wow. I can't even fathom how much $15 trillion is, but that's what the U.S. debt has now gotten mm -hmm. up to. We need to find a way to reverse that course. Some people would listen to this and they would say, well, you're just someone else who is engaging in class warfare because you're in, you know, jumping on the New York banks. Is that, is that true, Mike? It's not class warfare. What I'm saying by shared sacrifice, I mean, they're going to have to pay their fair share of solving the problem that we have in the federal budget. Now, how we get from A to B, I don't know. But I can tell you, the tax cuts that have happened in the last 20 years were good. I mean, they created growth, but they also created huge deficits. But the, what happened, what's really sad is, the tax rates on the American people who pay Social Security taxes never went down. Those have been steadily rising for over 20 years since Ronald Reagan instituted that huge tax increase back in 1986. Where does that tax fall? Disproportionately upon the middle class and the poor. They pay, they pay 15, or if they, if they don't own their own business, but they pay half of 15.3% of their wages. Well, if you're making 2000 a month and paying 7.8%, while the guy in New York is trading bonds, or Mike Young is trading bonds in Seattle, I'm making an above average rate of return on that. I make I make two thousand dollars that week in bonds. I'm not paying seven point eight percent tax on that, in addition to the regular taxes I pay. Do you see? Your mm. Investment income is not paying a social security income tax. But the average American is. That is a huge tax bite to someone making, you know, in twenty five to fifty thousand dollars a year. That's a huge bite. Michael, would you have said the same thing, you, Michael Young, five years ago? Yeah. I always felt that the, that the tax rates, the way we taxed in the country was unfair. It falls disproportionately on people who don't have the ability to pay it. As so you're a big-time Democrat, right? No, I'm not a big-time Democrat. I'm a Republican. I'm not saying you should raise tax rates across the board. What I'm saying is there has to be a workable solution where we can raise taxes, where people that can afford to pay it can't afford to pay more. Because you cannot finance two wars like we just went through and add all this debt. We've never done this before in American history. We fought two large land wars and never raised taxes to pay for them. In fact, we cut taxes while we were fighting these wars. Well, who paid the bill? We did. It went into the federal deficit. Now, people say, well, it's the deficit. We can finance it. This is bonds. That's not true. What happens eventually, what high levels of debt lead to is inflation, which means everything you and I buy costs more. Let me ask you a question. What did you pay for gasoline two years ago? It was a, it was a lot less than it is now. Yeah. Well, do you think it's all supply demand or do you think it's the value of the dollar? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. What is it? it? That's a good question. Is it the, because the value of the dollar keeps going down, or is it because there's not as much oil in the world? Last I checked, there was plenty of supply of oil around, but yet we're paying a lot more for oil prices. Why? Because the dollar has lost 20% of its value. Why? Because our interest rates are low and we're issuing a lot of debt. I think even if interest rates went up, the dollar might rally in the near term, but with the debt that we have, I mean, people are going to be shocked to learn this, but our debt ratio compared to GDP is beyond where Greece is. Really? 
we have now gone to a new level in America. And do you think we're getting value for this, Stan? Hmm. Do you think I, we're really getting a bargain for this? No, I haven't thought so. Let's let's talk about solutions. Okay. You know, there are some people out there who are trying to create solutions themselves. This is out of ABC News. This was by the woman of Don't Confuse Bank Transfer Day with Occupy Wall Street. She right. says this. Um, she and her, and it was the sole organizer of this. She said the principle behind monthly debit card fees were something I couldn't support as a conscious consumer. Investigating my options, credit unions were clearly the most logical choice. So she created bank transfer day. I mean, is that a right way to go to get your money out of banks and get it into credit unions? If you make that choice, but if you take your money out of banks, the credit union, guess where they have their account? With banks. With banks. <laughs> so it's kind of like robbing Peter to pay Paul. The answers have to come in, 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 in the federal budget. So Washington does play a role. It's a huge role because they've been, Washington has been hesitant to cut spending because we have uh, a fear that if we cut federal spending, the economy will get even worse. And there's some legitimate concerns about that. Mm -hmm. But how much worse is it going to get for the, when the day comes when we can't borrow any more money? Well, I, I guess me as a taxpayer, I would say, you know, yeah, I, I want you to cut spending on the military industrial complex. I want you to cut spending on uh, financing uh, banks that are bad actors. Right. I want you to, to cut that. I don't want you to cut spending on some necessary programs for people that can't yeah. handle themselves. The former Speaker of the House said something that I thought was very poignant in one of the debates. And um, Newt has, you know, I'm not going to vote for Newt Gingrich, but Newt said something that I thought was really important. The guys who sit in these committees in the House of Representatives writing the bills, this is where the taxes originate, where the spending originates, is in the House of Representatives. It's absolutely ridiculous that these committees have sat there for the last two years, or four years, or five years, or ten years, and now they've thrown up their hands and saying, oh my God, I don't know what we're going to do. We better have six people decide what we should do. Now, what kind of representative government is that? I mean, <laughs> this has gone from, uh, from a joke to joke to joke. And the reality is the people who write the tax bills and the spending bills in the House and the Senate in those committees have got to begin. They've got to, for the first time, actually look at a program and say, are we getting value here? Can we afford it? Hmm. And they've got to make those hard choices. It oh. shouldn't be six people on a super committee or eight people. Yeah. It should be in the, the hard work in those subcommittees that actually know the programs. But you know what the director of OMB told me? I was in Washington, D.C. back in 2003. And he was the director of OMB for uh, George Bush, and he was from Texas, and I can't remember his name, I'm sorry. But he said, you know, Mike, we tried, because I was bragging on him a little bit about the spending. He said, we went to Congress, and we tried to talk to them about making efficiencies in these programs. They didn't want to talk to us. He says, all they wanted to talk about was appropriating. They wanted nothing to do with oversight, how the money was spent, whether the programs were working. If someone says, we have a child nutrition problem, their answer is, we appropriated $8.9 billion. It should be fixed. And Congress is abdicating its responsibility. You know, I'm, I'm to the point where I've always been a conservative, but I'm beginning to think that until these people wake up and say, we've got to make these hard choices, maybe it's time that we all just sit back and say, we're not sending more in an, an incumbent back until he promises me he's actually going to do his job. You know, with that, Michael, we've got to end the show. But I want to make this announcement for all of you who are watching. You can go to the website, uh, go, go to YouTube, to the Public Exposure TV uh, web channel. And we've got a little bit of a bonus section that we're going to be getting to. And the question's going to be, Michael Young, you've got one year to fix the economy. What is it going to be? Thank you, Michael, very much. For those who are on television and signing off, but you're going to stay right where you are. All right, sir.